Hey everyone, welcome to the Analytic Mind podcast. Today I'm speaking with Adam Heppy. And Adam is, I think I got that right. Um, <laughs> um, Adam is uh, coming to us uh, from a company called Fiserv, huge um, multinational conglomerate in the sort of financial service, financial risk area, and is a senior manager in the data and analytics uh, team. And so I think there's plenty of great insights we could get from, you know, how you're going about things in uh, a firm that is focused on technology and embedding technology uh, with, their, with their customers um, and also in the financial space. Uh, but, uh, you know, also just w understanding how you're actually um, getting engagement in your projects and initiatives within your organization. So, you know, I'm, I'm excited to sort of um, get into or dive deeper into a lot of those things. Why don't I just throw to you, Adam, and you do a, a bit more of an intro, uh, give us a bit of your background um, and yeah, then we can kick things off from there. Sounds good. Uh, well, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. So my name is Adam Happy, and yeah, I went to UW Madison, and I got my undergrad and my master's in accounting. Moved into the public accounting sector with PwC down in Chicago. Uh, there's where I really got used to analyzing data sets. Uh, when we were looking at large hedge funds, uh, private equity funds, or fund of funds, when you start to do the analysis of the fund valuation, especially with the fund of funds. Uh, you get start get to play around with those different data sets, and that's really what piqued my interest um, across the whole thing. Moving on from there, I moved over to a mutual fund company back in Milwaukee. I uh, started uh, the audit function, more compliance lens focused, uh, and there I got to do a lot more analytics too. Uh, so we started to evaluate the traders um, on given trades. We started to assess uh, the portfolios that the traders were putting together on behalf of our clients to assure that it was aligned with with their needs and their risk tolerance. Uh, again, just kind of ever evolved my uh, facts first, emotion second when it comes to business. Uh, within the audit function, when I moved over to Pfizer, I've been there for about six years. Moving over there, I went in with a kind of a more traditional audit role, but really my focus was let's tell facts and not opinions. So I got a reputation right away for saying that and me vocalizing that very strongly. Uh, I got asked to set up an analytics function about four years ago. So at that time, it was just me doing ad hoc projects across uh, within our department. Um, and some, use, or some leaders in the organization kind of pinged me to say, hey, can we start to support some of these things with analytics? And we're able to accomplish those projects. Now today we span operational, financial, IT, um, and compliance domains across the organization. Uh, I have a team, we now have a VP that's dedicated to my function uh, and I have three other associates uh, that kind of work with me to develop these uh, metrics, dashboards, and any insight we can provide to senior leadership. Nice, nice. So, so I think it would be great because it seems like you were at the ground floor of how the analytics function evolved within your organization. And so I think it would be, be good just to, just to uh, go, go into that a little bit further. How, how do you think that came about? Like what was the trigger that caused someone to, or someone, someone an executive to realize, okay, we need an analytics function? Yeah, so with, we have this definitely in a very niche department of analytics um, as its focus, but being in an internal audit department, it really gives you privy to any of the data across the organization. Uh, since that is most audit department's charters that, hey, they can get whatever they want. <laughs> Nothing, nobody can challenge that, uh, which helps from a data perspective because that is one of the biggest challenges. However, in the audit department, there is a lot of risk that we need to essentially evaluate across the organization and that we're responsible in case we don't find it. So traditionally on the audit front, they go in and they take a look at a sample of 25, 30 items. Now, when you have upwards of 10,000, 100,000 items looking at such a small sample, it doesn't make any sense. Um, you're not gonna statistically find any issues, any errors. And when I'm coming into this, I'm like, I have a skill set. Why not do 100% testing across the border? So we can find compliance issues. We can find financial issues. We can find gaps in technology issues. And that's when, when I started to do my work, it's more work that speaks for itself 
and showing the effect that you can have on an organization versus a light bulb moment. Now, I have seen in, in different organizations and even leaders within our organization that you go to a conference, you say, okay, it's time of big data. This is what happens. But honestly, until they see results, especially for larger organizations, it's almost impossible to go from an, uh, a conference to say big data is the next big thing and truly implementing it. Um, right. The way all of these older organizations stand is that they were built on, hey, we need to do our operations and our processes and data was never a thought in their mind. So when they're growing an organization, like most organizations, they don't think about data as an asset. Now that is rapidly changing in today's economy and today's world, especially as people are working from home, as they're doing most of their shopping remotely, as they're doing their work remotely, um, telecommunications, data is becoming more viewed as an asset and a necessity for these organizations. Um, so specifically within mine, it was, hey, we have a spoke, our focus that we can expand what we do, minimizing the efforts of what we do and having bigger impact. Um, providing, we wanted to become more of a partnership with the business unit rather than be viewed as the traditional auditor cops, right? So if we could go promise to say, we can take a look at this data for you and now we can provide valuable insight versus just telling you where things went wrong. And that was really the key component of why we focused on standing up this specific function within our department. Nice. And do you think it was because of where the, the tools had got to? Like, you know, four or five years ago is when Power BI and Tableau and Click and, and all of these tools really got to a point where they were enterprise ready, I feel. You know, they were actually, uh, you were able to showcase the value to decision makers a lot easier than you could in the past. Yeah, I think it's a key component for your average everyday user to be able to show that value. Um, there is one hesitation I have about making that broad assumption for the use of analytics is when people think of analytics, they think of it as a very far off world. Like I don't have a technology background. I don't have a science degree. I can't possibly be doing this stuff to, to provide any benefit or I don't have the right tools in place. Now, if you think about analytics, you can scale that back from these fancy tools and say, I'm just going to use Excel. And if you know how to use Excel, you can do a lot of valuable um, measurements and workings with data to come to the same conclusions. Now, I do think that these strong tools like Power BI, Tableau, um, Alteryx, they do allow for the everyday user to be able to provide that insight without necessarily having a lot of that background information. Now, I still do see a huge drawback, not necessarily to the tool themselves, but to adoption. Because I still think at the end of the day, analytics is, it's a mindset more than it is anything else. You need to have somebody that's inquisitive, somebody that's searching, somebody that's trying to find that. And even though you can put a fancy Power BI or a Tableau dashboard on top of a data set, finding that user adoption can still be pretty difficult because A, they don't take the time to understand the data coming into the dashboard. B, they get flustered when they see the dashboard and they need to manipulate it in some way because we can't necessarily, as a smaller group, especially within my team, we can't necessarily always identify exactly what somebody wants the right slice of it to be. We can build these broad dashboards, allow for filtering, allow for things like that to be able to allow the end user um, the best value to get out of it to say, hey, you need to want to understand this data. You want to need to understand this problem and the solutions as bad as the guy who built it. And that is kind of more of the, str the struggle, in my opinion, is the adoption of that. But without, without question, it's made it a lot easier. And the tools have made it easier and more widespread for a larger base to get into that analytical mindset. Yeah, yeah, I, I yeah, uh, totally, totally, I agree. I agree. Now, it's interesting you um, mentioned about user engagement because I've, I've, I've got this a lot, especially um, as I've, I've spoken to a lot of data leaders and uh, on the podcast is that, uh, you know, as, as analysts or those with the analytic sort of mindset, 
we forget that there's a whole user base, a whole consumer, um, uh, you know, a range of consumers out there that you have to engage in what you're building, right? And so how did you go from, you know, how did you start introducing your work to consumers and and how did you showcase the value and how did they recognize the value? What are some of the, what are some of the key things that you think uh, enabled you to overcome those challenges? Sure. So the biggest thing for me is speed, right? If you can get a data set and you can show all the gaps within a data set, whether that is just a look at the data governance and the quality of the data, that is something right off the bat that it takes people a long time to do and realize. Um, the other thing is just the results. Once you have, especially if it's a narrowly focused project, you can turn results around within hours um, versus whereas historically, if you have it, it can take weeks, if not months to get to. Um, so that's really been the two biggest things. But overall, the, for our specific areas is making sure that it's relatable and understandable. Um, we've gone through historically about a training a month with our entire broader team to have them help adopt it, help them understand the data set and the tools. But then once we are able to build those specific dashboards for them, really sitting down with them and working with them. When they see what we're able to show them and put it into real life, it's, it's a completely different story that they're able to tell and it gives them the knowledge. And that's essentially what I focus on is thinking of a data set as knowledge and because knowledge is power, right? And I'm a guy, especially in the auditing realm, you potentially have that conflict with somebody because you're telling them potentially that something that they're doing is inadvertently affecting the company in a negative way, whether that is just a risk appetite um, or anything like that. So I like to come across and I like to teach everybody that does this is these data are fact. These data are facts. So unlike anything else, it's like, if you stick to these, you can definitively say something happened in one way or another. Now it's when people start to take those and put assumptions or opinions on top of those, that's kind of where I tell people, especially in my industry to scale back a little bit and lead with facts. Because if you can lead with facts that are agreeable by every single person on a call, then you can agree on the solution. And I think and that's where we start to see the biggest things is when you can start to agree step by step, then there's definitively no other step that you guys are going to disagree on, except maybe the how to. That sounds um, a lot like the US political situation, but uh, we won't go into that. <laughs> yes, uh, Agre agree agreeing to a set of facts. That's just what I keep hearing on the, on, on, on the news from the news channel. Yeah, it's, uh, it's <laughs> the US is a different world right now. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, what, what do you think about this? Like one of the one of the key uh, frameworks that I've I've come to settle on as a as a way to showcase the value really quickly because um, I like I like that aspect of speed as well. Like like being able to showcase uh, good insights quickly. Uh, that that's a big one. But also, if you can show someone that they can either make decisions quicker, they can optimize processes, they can work out ways to increase revenue or decrease costs. Those are some of the key things that, that your stakeholders are thinking about, right? And if you can show the returns in those particular areas, that's how you're going to get user engagement and stickability um, to the uh, implementations and the, and the initiatives that you're working on in the analytics space. Yeah, and one of my favorite things to build on that is, so like if we work with the finance department, we take a different perspective because mostly anybody who's in the organization in the day-to-day -day operations, that's what they're focused on is operational metrics. Now, when you think about a large company, you also have to think on the risk side. So that's where we come into play. And when we worked with the finance team, we were able to build a whole dashboard. I think it was seven dashboards around financial risk metrics to be able to give to them. And this is where I get excited is when they don't fight you on it. Because at the end of the day, for our group within audit is they should be a team or a partnership with whatever business unit you call. So when we do lead with facts, we do lead with data. They can't argue with it, right? And then when you go in there and you build something for them, it's like, 
we can both utilize this to both of our benefits. And that's when it starts to pique their interest. So we're more along the partnership phase. And when you can get that buy-in right off the bat from your, your end users, it's gonna help dramatically because then you can essentially build it in their vision without knowing it's their vision, but you can help build it in their vision and your vision to essentially serve both purposes and have it be multi-useful. Are you finding that you're partnering with analytically savvy individuals within these other departments? Like, are you, are you finding that you're not the only ones creating reports and that you're almost having to audit other people's reports as well? Yeah, so we do a handful of both, right? Um, so data as a whole across the industry, any of the industries is becoming this new thing although it's old at this point. If you're not on board, you're behind the times. Uh, but at the same time, there hasn't necessarily been the commitment across the industry. Yes, analytics is a good idea. Data visualization is a good idea, but it hasn't necessarily been bought in from a majority of these organizations. So yes, maybe the top five, 10%, they do have a chief data officer. Uh, Yes, maybe 10 years from now, that will be more towards 50%, but we're still in the early phases of it having to be a top-down push. Whereas right now it's individual groups within an organization pushing it upwards to say, hey, we can either do this more efficiently, I can cut down on my time, my work to automate some of this stuff. So what I've found is that there's really, within any organization, that there's smaller groups of pockets of these groups. So one of the things that we've been trying to do is starting to build um, essentially an affinity network uh, amongst all of those users to say, okay, we know this group over here in tax, this group in finance, this group in billing, this group in operations, we're all utilizing the same tools. So once you figure out your baseline of who's using it, A, you can partner with the tools themselves. You can work with each other to figure out, hey, how to get that next result. But for me, the partnerships that evolve from there are more related to, hey, how are we going to move the data posture of the company forward? Because if you have enough like-minded people that say the data is the future, the data is the answers, we need to go backwards a little bit in time, right? And understand the data. And until you move that piece forward with strong data governance, with strong infrastructure and modeling, Yes, there's just going to be all of these ad hoc groups, right? Because everybody is responsible for their own data sets. They're responsible for their own builds. And it's tough to incorporate at a large enterprise scale until you start to put in the work of getting that data structured and organized in the right way. Yeah, that's a good one. I, 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 want, to, I want to just expand on that a little bit. Um, and I think using your experience from starting almost from scratch in the an analytics um, area in your in your firm is a is a is a good thing to leverage off because one of the, one of the difficult things that i think a lot of um, organizations still face and will face for some time is the siloed data um, that everyone has because everyone has legacy systems or just systems from different eras and so how have you gone about trying to solve those challenges yeah, so that's the unique challenge with any organization, mine included. Uh, so what we're really trying to do is essentially start to evaluate the use of a data lake. So we can bring in a bunch of data from a variety of different sources, and it helps a lot too, because once you start to build a data lake, yes, it might be siloed data sets at the beginning, right? Because you do have required projects. But moving on, once you start to build more and more individual data sets within that data lake, now you can start to triangulate some of the data, right? So for example, if you take an asset management system, great, you can evaluate asset management in a silo by itself, awesome. But down the road, now you start to take incidents, you start to take change management, you start to take performance management. Now you can utilize all those data sets because once you start to bring them in, clean them, make sure that they're linked properly, they have the right keys across tables, you can start to provide a lot more insight 
not only from a technological or an asset management perspective, but also from a finance management perspective. And that's what a lot of things people don't understand is they think of things in silos. So when you think about infrastructure vulnerability, you're like, no, well, I just got to focus on this. I got to clean up my vulnerabilities and make sure it's security. Nobody really, some top level individuals, they will, yes, but they don't necessarily monetize it on the go to say, hey, if we have this type of vulnerability and it's going to expend this much effort, we multiply it by this many different types of assets that we have with this vulnerability. Being able to triangulate a lot of that information and then you start to bring in the financial recording systems, you can start to triangulate that even further. And now you can say, you can specifically monetize all of your risks across the organization. And that's when you can truly still have a, a really strong independent risk evaluation system. Mm. So, so long story short, it's really just trying to create our own data lake for our purposes. And what we're doing is we're kind of teaming up with the risk organization um, on a lower levels to say, okay, we're going after some of the same things. What if we team up and create that data lake? And there's always a thought in your mind that we can create this data lake and then we can teach users how to build self-service uh, dashboarding or data visualization. Because once you have a strong data source, people can tell their own stories. Right now, if you have disparate systems, some of the numbers might not match up from this system to this system. And you have two different groups telling different stories about the same idea. And now when it gets up to senior leadership, they don't know what to think because this person's saying this number, this person's saying this number. And that's when it seems like facts really diminish down to more opinions at that point. And we're trying to really get away from that. So coming up with one centralized data repository that can, you can tell one story on is, is key going forward. And so just, just digging into the data lake a little bit more, how do you go, how have you gone about actually just setting it up from deciding, okay, data lake is the way to go. How, how are you identifying which data sets you should bring into it? And then maybe just expand on like, how, like, how are you actually doing it? Like what technology are you sure. using to create that data lake? Just so I, I think that would be really beneficial just to get a clear picture in everyone's mind. Yeah, absolutely. So we're focusing on utilizing the SQL server um, for our data lake um, on the back end because the Power BI does connect very nicely uh, to the SQL Server. So we utilize Power BI online or the server version. So that way you can schedule reports, you can reschedule refreshes, things along those lines. So that's kind of the back end. We were, I used to be a Tableau guy um, due to enterprise licensing, it made sense to go with Microsoft. So we switched over to Power BI. Um, the functionality is getting to start to be parallel, but I still think Tableau's a little bit more superior um, in some of the, the some of the functionality, um, but Power BI has come a long, long way. Uh, on the front end, we use Alteryx to be able to capture data, modify, transform it, and then push it into the SQL Server. So that's really what we're using, kind of as the middle ETL tool. Um, it's become straightforward. There is no coding necessary to learn how to use the tool. Uh, the learning curve is very short. Um, and we can start to kind of move data at large quantities. Now, as far as figuring out which data sets we want to take a look at, um, it's kind of a two, two hand or double sided sword here because we are forced into which data sets we need to evaluate based on a risk assessment. So that's really how where we focus it is we perform a risk assessment across the whole organization. And then we can break it down into miniature projects. And then we start to tackle those. Now, like I said earlier about triangulating data, that's really where my focus is. So I start to take on projects that are tangentially related. So then that way we can deliver more value to senior leadership. Cool. And with the data lake, how you're, you're bringing data in from lots of systems, right? So how are you deciding how to structure your data lake or, or does the structure not even matter? Are you just like throwing everything in there? You know, I, I presume, you know, you've got to have some governance around how you do it so that you, you know, anyone who connects to it knows where to go or knows, knows what to connect to, you know, how, how, how do you sort of structure it, um, you know, to, to make it accessible to the self-service user eventually? Yeah, absolutely. So that makes, it's a great question. So we've been kind of going at it from an iterative process because 
we are very focused on trend analysis as well. So uh, this has been a comment or a conversation that we've had with a colleague of mine who we don't have a traditional data architect on our team. So that's one thing that's very unique about us. Now, the, one of my counterparts or colleagues, they do have a data architect and they modify the data infrastructure in a very specific way. And we talked about it. So mostly what we do is we take a data set for a certain time value. If we need have additional details for the next period, we'll just depend that data. So then that way it still lines up and Alteryx does that very well, right? Because it says what columns you're putting in there and then the, it adds a date and then we can move it over. Now, I was talking with that and they have a traditional data architect and he says, yeah, traditionally that would have been a weird structure, but because there are all of these tools now that can reinterpret, so Power BI taking the full data set. Now, if you have columns that are 60, 70, 80 columns deep, it's not as big of a deal. And it honestly almost works better for these tools because now this tool doesn't need to go read this table to connect to this table, to connect to this table, to get a single detail. Um, so I found it beneficial to kind of keep for a specific data set, the data points intact across the board and just have multiple iterations. Now, one of the things I think that has allowed us to do that has come with how cheap data space is. So having a server, and getting five gigabytes or a terabyte worth of data today is much cheaper than it was 10 years ago, 20 years ago. So being able to house that much data is becoming cheaper and allows us the ability to do that. And just to give us some perspective on how much cheaper, like what, what sort of percentage are we talking? So it's come down quite a bit. So for our server space, um, we're talking five gigabytes. We paid less than $1,500 for because we didn't have to pay for the hardware. So right. if you talk about that, but if you so say if you're an independent organization and you have to stand up a server, you're talking probably about $60,000. So now moving to the cloud, which a lot of people are doing, utilizing Snowflake or whatnot, you can now get it even cheaper through AWS. Um, I was working on a side project and I think it's pennies. It's honestly pennies for megabytes of space. Right. So it ha has become way cheaper and more available for people to use. And when you say, because um, I think, you know, there, there, there's a, a lot of our listeners um, aren't as uh, across, you know, some of the more IT database related um, uh, to topics like with, with, with cloud databases, et cetera. So when you say like five gigs, are you, you know, is, that can contain a lot of data, right? Like we're talking millions of rows um, in just that. Yeah, so, and that's the thing with servers. Servers are set up very differently. So people who aren't familiar with the technology, technology space, you can have two different types of servers, right? One that runs in OS or one that's set up for database structure. So if uh, a server is set up for a database structure, the data is compressed at very high rates, which allows for you to store millions upon millions of records at a very low um, data need. So it does, it compresses all this data. I wanna say the compression rate for these is like around 50, uh, 50 to one, as far as a compression goes. Um, don't quote me on that. That's from a conversation I had three years ago when I was setting this up, um, but it's, it's astronomically different than it was. Uh, even that was part of the discussion I've had with some of the data architects is, yeah, like this isn't a traditional architectural style for data, but because the space is cheap, it, it doesn't really matter anymore. Yeah, and, and I think the same can be said, like, like you mentioned earlier, the versatility of um, say like a Power BI to uh, do a lot of the data cleaning and transformations has gone up exponentially as well. Um, and so, you know, you probably don't have to do as much work in the sort of data lake or the, the you know, the data warehouse equivalent in, in, in the past. Like a lot of that stuff can now be done, um, you know, in Power BI and some of the front end tools and the self-service tools. 
Yeah. So even from that perspective, we use Altrix, which is a super powerful tool from the, from the ETL perspective. And it's everything is a drag and drop. So you don't need to clean any data anymore. You can change data types. You can change leading spaces, ending spaces. You can change uh, the capitalization structure of words. Um, there's so much you can do. You can convert uh, this small table in an Excel spreadsheet into a table itself. Like it doesn't need to be set up perfectly in any manner. You can transpose columns and rows. Uh, it's been super helpful from that perspective. And being able to be able to go into a data lake knowing you don't have to do anything to it is a fantastic feeling because it just makes your job that much easier. And I think what people don't understand when they get into the analytics realm or if they're not in it, they're just kind of looking from the outside in is how much work goes in on the front end for a lot of these teams to A, obtain the data, B, clean it and get it to a point where it's reportable. Yeah, for sure. Now, one of the things I'm trying to do with my group, which is a little bit antithesis of that, is actually stop cleaning the data because this is something that is going to be a big issue going forward. And I think there is a detriment that our, our industry per se, is doing to internal organizations is that we're cleaning all the data across all these systems. We're making cross tables to marry this one to this one versus truly showing the details of the underlying data. So I'm tr not trying to expose, but trying to make people aware of that. If there are certain fields that, hey, all these things aren't spelled the right way, if they are blanks, if there are, you name it, I like to call it out because I think it's important from the front end that we start to think about data as an asset and just be like, well, just tell me the story I want to tell. I'm like, well, the story I want you to tell is you guys need to take care, better care of your data. You guys need to. So until it's a universal thing across an organization, that work is still going to have to keep working. And for me, it's going to kind of be dual fold one to show the areas, but then at the same time, you can't really piss that many people off. So you still have to give them what they want and say, yes, if this belongs to this organization, we'll clean it up and make it look pretty wrong. Your organizational structure versus showing you what the data is looks like. Yeah, nice, nice. Now, I, I totally agree uh, regarding the data asset um, trend. And I feel like we're in such early days regarding how organizations will be able to monetize their data assets better. Um, I, I saw something recently on Snowflake where they are actually creating the ability for any the, the organizations to monetize their assets and, the, and others can sort of connect into their data sources in a, in a, in a really easy and, and simple way. So I, I'm starting to see it happen more and more, but as I say, it's still, still early days. I was wondering to get your perspective on how do you think uh, businesses can identify these data assets or ways that they can monetize their data assets? Like, and is there some examples, high level examples that you could maybe give um, that, that you're sort of dealing in? Because, you know, it's great that you've, you know, you've got experience across, across a, a wide range of functions within, within your organization. Yeah, and I think that really, it spans into two prongs, right, of how to monetize data. It's either you create additional revenues or you save costs. So to me, now if somebody, they might not say saving costs is monetizing data, but I would beg to argue that. And I honestly think that's going to be the first big road. The next notch in the road map is evaluating data to save money. And then once they start to see that, because a lot of organizations, they are more conservative. So that's the path they're going to go down. Now on the flip side, some easy ones from that is, hey, taking a look at operations as far as how many people are touching a process. Uh, look at the billing organization. Are you guys sending, if you have a ton of clients or a, different, a ton of different business lines, are you guys billing people separately? Are you billing them together? How many bills are they receiving? You can start to analyze things like such as, hey, are we issuing credit memos for bills two days after we sent them where we messed up on billing? There's a lot of indicative data points that can show an inefficient process. So 
you can take it down to the vendor management uh, and the sourcing team. You can start to evaluate all of the partnerships across the organization that essentially accomplish the same tasks. Then you start to bring those in and say, hey, we have purchasing power if we start to collapse some of these contracts and we go with one provider or if we go to one provider with one solidified group of people. So that is probably one of the biggest things is saving money. Whether that is people's time through automation, um, RPA is gonna be the, essentially the next step in this process. Um, one of the bigger things for saving money on that front is call centers. So if we can start to automate, do voice recognition, and then we translate voice recognition into say either complaints, into incidents, or anything else somebody's calling in, now you're just saving time and time is money. So that's a big use of more automated analytics. Now, as far as monetizing from selling data or utilizing data to make better decisions, there's been companies over the past five years that that was their sole purpose, right? So one of the examples I like to use is MoviePass. So they were giving essentially, you can go see as many movies as you want in the movie theater uh, as long as you pay 10 bucks a month. And yes, they were losing money on every single movie that they were paying for somebody to go see. But what they were doing on the back end is collecting millions upon millions upon millions of data points. And now they can essentially take that and sell that to movie com or produ production companies to say, hey, who's who should this be marketing to? What types of movies? Blah, 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 blah. And you can really do that in any industry, which is probably one of the most fascinating things is because some people will say, well, this doesn't necessarily apply. If you want to take this and apply this to an investment company, you can start to evaluate who makes investments, what types of investments they make. And now you know who to go after, right? They've been using this for marketing forever. This is marketing statistics. And that's essentially how you come up with your population. Now, one of the things on the Pfizer side with what the space that we're in, so we are in the payment space. We know when people make payments, what they make payments for and what they're buying. You can start to think about that and take that and you can start to monetize that um, because there are plenty of credit agencies. There are plenty of consumer agencies that would love to have that wealth of knowledge. When you are an industry leader as big as Pfizer and you have as many data points, uh, the amount of value that that can be provided is astronomical. Now, the big caveat with, with the data and monetizing it is really staying within your bounds from a compliance perspective. Uh, because there are so many regulations um, and with the new administration, there's going to be an increased regulatory environment um, with Joe Biden, which is known great for my industry from an auditor perspective. But with that comes a lot of risk, right? Because you don't necessarily want to make the wrong data play to make somebody's information insecure because that would be the number one downfall of any company is getting rid of somebody's, your client's information, right? So it's a, it's a big, it's, data is a very, very large asset, but it's also a big risk, right? Uh, so that's why cybersecurity is pertinent to all these industries and all these large companies mm -hmm. to make sure that they have their information locked down, but making a smart move and really putting a plan and data strategy around how you want to monetize it. Because I think anybody could tell you, yeah, you can look at a company, no matter what they are, and you can figure out how you can make money off of that, whether that's increased sales or whether that's a whole new revenue line with just selling the data and not necessarily focusing on incurring more revenue through your traditional lines. Mm -hmm. Yeah, nice, nice. No, I like, I like, I like a lot of those examples that you gave, and and really that's only scratching the surface, right? In terms of you know what is what is actually possible. So we're getting to the end here, I think, and um, really interesting conversation. I've really enjoyed hearing a lot of your thoughts and ideas around the space. What are just to finish off? What are what are some of the trends that that you're seeing that are exciting you in the analytics space? Um, you know, pretty broad question here. Could be about you know any aspect of, of the of the um, area of the industry. So 
yeah, just interested to hear what, what, what you think is coming down the pipe and what is exciting you the most about it. The thing that excites me is the renewed effort around it and the, the buy-in from senior leadership. So Pfizer have just cracked. We're in the Fortune 200 range and we just announced a chief data officer within the last week. And okay. so I think that will continue to expand this throughout the smaller companies because they will start to identify the focus. And the other thing, I think I mentioned this earlier is there are a lot of pockets of groups that are popping up because everybody does see the value of what analytics can provide to different parts of the organization. So the thing that I'm most hopeful and most excited about is to see that progression and where it ends because there is so much, so many silos. There's already silos within an organization. And then if you have data silos, and then if you have people working on the data silos for them too, once you start to bring them all together, the scale that of what's achievable is potentially limitless and really excited to see as the shift continues to grow towards that. And then lastly, as that builds up, the move into automation. Um, the automation piece has been extremely exciting for me. Um, we've been tasked with building out some RPA with some bots. Um, so we're gonna be exploring that in the near future uh, just to figure out how to make people's lives easier. And I think that's essentially what we want to get to. And that's my entire focus is taking the emotion out of business and making business decisions based on facts rather than emotions. Yeah, and, and you could uh, put intuition in there uh, as well. Yes. Yeah. Okay, yeah, I, 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 this is, a, this is a, a theme that is, is relevant in almost every discussion I have is the, the huge opportunity out there, right? And um, the analysis that can be done, the automation that can be uh, cre created, um, you know, making people's lives easier um, is, 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 you know, we're just, we are literally just getting started. I mean, there is so much opportunity to add value in so many aspects of um, all the organizations. It's, it's absolutely crazy. And so I definitely, you know, can see the same things that you're, you're highlighted there. It's, a, it's an expe it's exciting place to be for sure. Absolutely. Okay, Adam. Hey, really enjoyed, uh, really enjoyed our discussion. So, really appreciate um, you know your time today. Um, I think I think there's plenty of unique insights there that um, that can be taken away and uh, and implemented. Uh, you know, within what others are doing for sure. You know, even myself, I learned uh, learned quite a bit today. Likewise, I appreciate the opportunity. Cool. Okay. Well, thanks everyone. Thanks for tuning in to the Analytic Mind podcast. Um, really, um, really great to collect uh, data leaders from you know everywhere around the world to to discuss to discuss this you know, really interesting space and and yeah, Adam, really appreciate your your thoughts today. Uh, don't forget to subscribe and to leave uh, any feedback or, or comments in your favorite uh, listening app. Uh, we we do read them and we do uh, take take on the feedback and and make sure we. Uh, structure our uh, content and, and um, the uh, offering on this podcast around what you want. So, so definitely, um, definitely do that. Um, we really appreciate it as always. Okay. Take care, everyone. Until the next time. See you later.